Mohammed, we're going to go ahead and start yep. this presentation. Greetings, everyone, yep. and welcome to this webinar. Today, we will be discussing about hands-on medical devices risk assessment. My name is Arta Lamani, the PECB organizer of this webinar, and the guest for today is Mohammed El Mahdi, PECB certified trainer who has extensive experience in lead auditor ISO 13485. I would also like to apologize for the delay in the webinar. However, please write your questions and comments in the chat box in the right-hand control panel, or you can use the function of a raise hand. We will unmute you and you will have a chance to ask the question directly, and Mohammed will answer to them accordingly at the end of the presentation. Please, Mohammed, you may start the presentation. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Mohammed Al Mahdi. Um, uh, I have about 12 year experience about medical device. I'm now working as an auditor and as well as a technical file reviewer. Uh, so today we will discuss um, medical device risk assessment, a specific topic. We will not go uh, step by step in the standard. However, we will uh, check some point uh, need to be tackled uh, in the standard related to the risk assessment. Um, as I have highlighted previously, this training session is not designed uh, to be a comprehensive training for ISO 4971. And instead, uh, I will address some issues um, raised during my review of some technical file, uh, raised during my audit for um, Clause 7.1 of the standard for the risk assessment. So it will be transferred some of my experience about the risk assessment revision. Let's start, before we go through the uh, presentation, let's agree uh, some helpful terms uh, and as defined in the 14, um, 4971 standard, like harm, as you, as you all know, it's a physical injury or damage to the health of the people or damage to property or the environment. Hazard is a potential source of harm. Hazard the situation is circumstances in which people, property, or environment are exposed to one or more hazards. Life cycle, which I need to tackle and I need to stress on today, which is all phases in the life of the medical device, from birth to death, uh, from the initial conception, from thinking about the, the medical device itself, to the final decommissioning and disposal of the product. Post to production, this part is always uh, being forgotten by uh, most of the user of the uh, risk assessment in the medical device field, which is supposed to First production experience monitoring, which is tackled by MedDev, uh, as you know, for the which is some, one of the supported documents of the medical device directive. Uh, so the post production phase as well need to be addressed in the risk assessment. So the definition of post production is part of the life cycle of the product after the design has been completed and medical device has been manufactured. One important term, which is a residual risk, which is a risk remaining after risk control measure have been taken. Risk life cycle, which is the main point we need to stress during this presentation. It is pre-production phase, or I call it so-called the pre-production phase, and the production phase of the product and push to production for phase. So we will cascade them together one by one in such in some way. Uh, production phase, pre-production phase, it starts from the conceptual point of view. It is about thinking about the product. Then the feasibility study of the product, which we need to address all risks about the patient will be using this the physician and the associate, all associated personnel 
uh, will be uh, come nearby the product or might be affected by the product. Then the design phase, then the compatibility phase. The compatibility phase here, it addresses the compatibility with other products that come in touch with, the, with your device. For example, if you produce a blood line, it will be uh, the interconnection between the blood line and the dialyzer, for example. If it, there is defibrillator, it, is, it will be the compatibility with other product will be connected to the defibrillator. And biocompatibility as well is one of the issues to be addressed during this phase, which is uh, according to the uh, 10993. The biocompatibility, as you know, it has a requirement to, uh, to say that the product, or to confirm that the product uh, is safe to be used uh, with, the, with the personnel or with the, with the patient. For example, the cytotoxicity, the sensitization, irritation, genotoxicity, etc. Then the clinical evaluation, which address the technical points related to the uh, related to the device. Then, after that, we we start the production. Before starting the production, we need to put ahead a risk assessment for each of those parts. From the conceptual point of view, we have to address in the uh, specified requirements that the risk is one part of the standard uh, of the product itself. How we get, we have to do this is to take the product in part. For example, if I have it pressure needle or whatever, even it has, if it has software, we have to take it in part. We have to cut it in pieces, the product in question, and we take each part convert the component of the product into a tree and you take each part of this uh, uh, of this product in order to be assessed according to the uh, the methodology we will be using that we will be addressed addressing later like polio model effect analysis FTA etc in the in the design phase we have to make something like uh, polio model effect analysis for the design uh, then the compatibility, we will address the requirement of 10993-1, which contain a specific requirement about the duration uh, for the product to be used and the, 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 the risk itself about adhering the product or putting or implanting the product into the body. In the clinical evaluation phase, we will check how others has been affected by other product, similar product in the market, and we will check those stuff, and we will make use of them as an in, as an input for our risk assessment. Then the product. Once we get come to the production, as you know, the production risk assessment is being addressed by. If we go back to the Deming era about addressing the main requirement for the uh, for uh, which is Plan Do Check Act which has now been used for all standards like 9001, uh, 13485, uh, 18001, 14001, 20, 2001 even. All of these standards is using the, uh, the Plan, Do, Check, Act methodology. But if we dig deeper in this, in, in the uh, what uh, Deming said and what the follower of Deming has been highlighted, what is, what's meant by planning, we can address that the planning uh, required by Deming is just an assessment for the risk assessment. Let us talk about this part, for example, if we speak about purchasing for the production. Purchasing requirement is addressing, you need to secure the, the production from the failure to come one day and to find that the raw material warehouse doesn't contain some product to produce which is considered as a risk. So we have to make risk assessment, which is a production plan. So the purchasing is a planning. The preventive maintenance is, is planning, which is risk assessment to make the, uh, the, production, the production machine working all the time. So the, if we go through the standard, all part of the standard, it's based on the risk assessment. This is why the, the new cycle like BDA, like Malcolm Bridge cycle and the radar, radar 
method for uh, the make and the radar method for the uh, uh, model of excellence is addressing the risk assessment as as initial part of their cycle. So they have converted the plan do check act into assess do check act. I know they are using different synonym synonyms, but it is still assess do check act. So if we come to this point and we can look to the production phase, all the production phase for the product, all the steps need to, to have risk assessment, even the lack of uh, raw material, whatever the uh, uh, any step of the production which might affect the uh, uh, the uh, microbiology of the product need to be assessed. The uh, uh, the production machine and the effect of the production machine of the product, the effect of the packaging machine, the effect of sterilization, etc. All of these stuff need to be addressed during the production by using whatever the mean. Finally, it is all about risk assessment. It is uh, the phase after producing the product, it has to be assessed as well, like the same way as uh, using one of, the one of the risk assessment in order to address the booster production experience, which has to be gained from the market by the sales or marketing people to collect the data of the product in order to be used and to be integrated as an input to the risk assessment. The complaint, if, the, if I have any complaint coming up after the booster production, we have to, add, to take this complaint as one of the inputs to the risk assessment. As well, the recall. If I have recalled the product, it means that this recalls it means that I have an, a, a big or immense effect of the product to the patient or to the market or even to the reputation of the uh, of the company. So all of this part need to be readdressed and recycled back to the risk assessment cycle. Advisory notices. If I, as an auditor, for example, if I find that you have an advisory notice uh, uh, claiming that the uh, direction for you is lacking some information and you didn't, uh, you didn't. Uh, Look again, or you didn't you didn't revisit the risk assessment and address what you have mentioned in the advisory notice and the risk assessment. This will be an issue as well. Vigilance case is one of the important things that need to to be addressed in the risk assessment. But I need here to pay the attention that not only the uh, vigilance the related to your product need to enter to your risk assessment. Risk assessment is basically uh, to capture potential harms, potential risks, potential hazards. So I can make use of the uh, uh, vigilance uh, systems like the one in the MHRA or the one in the FDA website as an input to my risk assessment. Then this cycle is about to be updated regularly. So what I need to conclude for, for this part of that Pre-production phase, production phase, post-production phase, it needs you to address or to keep live the risk assessment document. So from this part, we need to say that the risk assessment is a dynamic process. This dynamic process can be changed uh, every, let's say, every, every month, every week accordingly. All activity happen in the production, all activity take place after the product being in the market or even changes to the market requirements and it changes uh, having coming up from the uh, recall and the vigilance system happy, uh, uh, takes place all over the world all of this need to enter to your risk assessment then as you know the risk assessment phases for whatever the risk has to follow the risk assessment structure as being anticipated and detailed and illustrated in the in ISO standard 14.971. So, uh, let's start the process with the risk analysis. Let me stress on the point analysis, what the word analysis mean. From my experience in this, I found that the, when any of the regulators speaking about analysis, it means it, you need to cut in pieces the process and you need to check and to address all parts, cascaded, all cascaded parts 
in two subpart, then you will check the risk of this subpart. So let us say that the word analysis means having a big part in two small pieces to be to have the risk a comprehensive risk assessment each, and then you check the interrelation between those pieces. So the risk analysis is determining the user needs, intended use, hazard, hazard identification by whatever the methodology, then risk. Risk evaluation then. Now I have for the risk analysis, I have started and I have captured a binality of risk or number of risks that need to be quantified. It need to be evaluated. So I do risk acceptability decision. After then, I start to the risk control. The risk assessment as a definition, it is having the risk analysis and the risk evaluation. You can now say that you have assessed the risk. But assessing the risk, those risks need to be controlled. So you will start another part of the risk management, which is the risk control, to check how you are going to mitigate, how you will mitigate those risks part by part. You have option analysis. You can implementation of those analysis uh, or, or those uh, uh, compensating provision and highlighting the residual risk. And you evaluate those residual risk and then take overall risk acceptance. Boost to production. It's a boost of production experience gained, then review the risk management experience in order to be as part of the, uh, to, to make the risk assessment live, to make it dynamic, to make it uh, available to capture or allowing the risk assessment to capture whatever the change in the regulation, in the market niche, in the uh, whatever protruded or coming up to the market. Now, have high level combination of severity and probability. Most of the people are speaking about the when they come to the risk assessment, they come to the point severity uh, and the probability, or sometimes they call it severity and likely would both the same, which is the giving us giving us the uh, the point of uh, how often might be the product or might be the risk occur. Here, if you go to the uh, left bar, it is increasing the probability, it is the probability against increasing the severity and the harm or consequences. This yellow part is low, means low risk. When it increases the, the likelihood or the severity increase, it, it transfer you to the medium risk, then to the high risk, which is in some occasion become uh, intolerable or not, uh, not acceptable at all. Risk assessment methodology. So if I need, when I need to make risk assessment, I need some tools in my hand to enable me to make a robust risk assessment. So I have to risk matrix methodology, the BHA, which is preliminary hazard analysis, fault tree analysis, FEMICA, which is a failure mode, effect criticality analysis, and hazard, which is a hazard operability analysis, and the HACCP, uh, which is hazard analysis and the critical control point. You can use all of them. You can use uh, one of them. You can use uh, in combination both of them. It depends about your background about the methodology. So my recommendation here to use the method, all of them, uh, if, you, if you analyze, if you make analysis for all of them, you will find that all of them is um, considering the same, uh, consider the t same logic of the mind. So do whatever the method you are aware about. You can combine two methodologies, which I can recommend in case of, uh, if you have um, your product contain uh, board design or electrical circuit, I think you will need to have the F FTA analysis along with the HACCP or the FEMIA or the uh, other any other methodology. But the engineer at your side will think about FTA because this is a, it is something given up about the uh, the what's pop up 
and what is the interrelation between uh, the synchronization between two failures together. But most of the people are using the failure mode and the effect analysis because it's handy and most of the people have the uh, uh, knowledge about it. But all of them are okay. Uh, today uh, I will not go in depth for the uh, each methodology but I will get some uh, wording about each of which. Portrait analysis for example, this is a team based method used to identify the casual chain that creates a hazard or a failure mode. Effects are typically ignored. A foot tray analysis presents the sequence and the combination of possible events that may lead to a failure. And I think this is, if you go through the failure mode and the effect analysis and hazard, you will find, you will, do, you will not find that the, those methodologies give you interaction between uh, two failures or it doesn't give you about the synergy between failures it, 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 each other but this methodology gave, allow you to make the compilation between two methods or two failures together and you can analyze both of them at the same time. Uh, once cause, causes are identified preventive action can be taken. Again this method and the failure mode and the effect analysis are the same in the logic thinking However, each of which can be used accordingly. Failure mode and the effect analysis, you check, as we say, we have we are doing the analysis. Analysis means you cascade or you subdivide the uh, process or the part of the product or you, you subdivide the, uh, uh, the sub-process that you are uh, addressing in the risk assessment in two parts. So here the analysis, device function for example, potential failure, in this example, light failure, potential effect, treatment, setup time increases. Severity here is classified as two, according to the, uh, the table he is using. This is just an example. Potential causes is burnout bulb. Uh, current control, there is no, so the detectivity here is, uh, detectivity is four, and the occurrence is four. The RBN combination of all of them is 32. Then he have applied the recommended action with better line source, redundant source, quick change light bulb, which make the uh, classification of those alternatives which mitigate the uh, severity become two as is because no change, uh, but the occurrence decreased in three and in case of you have quick change to the light bulb, the occurrence decreased to one. Again, you will reach another another RBN which gave you uh, or which mitigate the risk according to the compensation provision or the control you have added to your failure mode and effective answer. Uh, create the SOD SOD table, which is the severity test linked to the end product functional failure, medical department involvement, occurrence, use historical data similar process. This is just to give you some information how you collect the severity, how you know uh, uh, how you know about the number which been used in the severity and the occurrence and detection. In the severity you need to link in the product functional failure, medical department involvement, you get the people together and to check and to, to make voting between uh, between them to, to highlight the severity of the product. Then occurrence we can use the historical data or you can use similar product to process. For example, I'm producing now uh, Beastmaker and I have another product which is doing uh, somewhat uh, same method, same uh, mode of action. So I will check the occurrence, what happened there. As well, the occurrence can be, uh, uh, you, can, you, can, you can make use of the data coming up from the uh, failure modes, coming up from the Warning letter coming up from the uh, uh, WHO, from the uh, Mahara MHRA in UK, and from the FDA website. Detection. This method. This uh, it depends on the method validation studies you have done inside the production uh, and the uh, research and development department in the company, and historical data about failure and detection. Finally, 
to make the failure mode and effect analysis. As we say previously that we need to make the risk assessment in the pre-phase, pre-production phase, in the production phase, post-production phase, so we need at least FEMIA for the system, for the subsystem, for example, the, the, the uh, uh, if I have a dialyzer, for example, so risk assessment for the fiber itself, for the house, for the cab, for the vent, for the risk assessment for the subsystem, component, failure mode and effect analysis, equipment, failure mode and effect analysis, automation, uh, for the mode and effect analysis, design, failure mode and effect analysis, process FEMIA, including the, uh, if it has been applied, the sterilization or bonding, uh, like if you take two plastic bars together and you sample them together to show the validation or the process failure more than the effect analysis for the bonding, for the heating, for the deviologenation, etc. Service FMEA. So if you have a booster production uh, phase which, uh, which entitles you to make some service on the product at the premises of, uh, of the client, like if you have a uh, an imaging device and need to be maintained and you, have, you need to have some services uh, at the client side, so we need to make service failure mode and the effect analysis and then improvement failure mode and the effect analysis. It is not failure, specific failure mode and the effect analysis, but it is just an update for the above mentioned types of failure mode and the effect analysis. Hazard methodology, it's, a, it's not common in the medical device field, I know, but uh, it might be used. It gave you the choices of if, if it doesn't work, if it, if it works erroneously, and other than this, what will be happening? For the transfer of the product for, for, or the material, uh, for the end of destination. Hazard methodology, I, from my belief, my personal belief, it is quite difficult to use in the medical device or the product I have addressed in my life. Uh, you might address or make use of the HASM, but uh, by discussing this point with some of the friends using the same methodology in uh, other fields like gamma irradiation field and the uh, uh, health and safety field, they say that the HASM is one of the most important part for them. HACCP system, which is widely used in the, uh, in the food safety, uh, is being, it can be used here in, in the medical device field. And uh, for the last decade, even the pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical industry start to integrate the HACCP system inside their work. Uh, let me highlight here or put a note that the HACCP system it is not originally for food sector. The food uh, for the FAO, for uh, the food uh, organiz organization, international organization, has been taken the HACCP system, which was being used in the in the uh, uh, in the gamma radiation field, in the uh, reactor field, and they make use of it. So HACCP system is not originally for the food sector; it is for the radiology section, uh, for the radiology sector. It's been first used in the radiology, not in the food sector. However, HACCP system uh, can be used, and I, and I have seen uh, thousands of first specimen relying on the HACCP system, which is quite a, a, a comprehensive methodology to capture all of the information coming up or all of the hazard uh, coming up during the production or for the product itself or for the clinical use of the product. The HACCP system is, as per the, the, uh, the definition of the letter, which is hazard analysis and the critical, identifying the critical point and to, to find the critical, sorry, the control which is deemed critical uh, for this hazard. In order to take this critical control and to put it under a scope and then you challenge this by HACCP plan to mitigate the risk and to take the risk under your eye and to strengthen the control because it is, by, uh, by definition, it's a critical control. So the risk management system, biological hazard, take chemical hazard, physical hazard, and then uh, this method uh, classify the same way like the severity and the likelihood, then they put the control and they check the after 
the severity and the likelihood. Now they have quantified the hazard itself. And then they make a decision tree or using mathematical approach in order to make quantification for the, for the strength of the control. And they then they, they compare them together to decide is this risk, is this control can cope with the hazard identified or not according to the mathematical methodology used. And then finally it decides if we find that the control is quite weak and the hazard is quite high, so they convert this point into critical control point to strengthen and to put this hazard under the scope of the hazard plan, uh, then a mitigation and um, more control and the synergetic control is being applied to strengthen such critical control. Risk concept according to ISO 49.71 will be the uh, intolerable region, which is the red one, and we have a large, sorry, and we have a large, which we need to discuss this point because this, this point uh, for the alarm system or as low as reasonably practicable region. This is quite questionable for the harmonization of 14971 as we will address in our training right now. And the PAR, which is the acceptable region, broadly acceptable region. Putting in mind, this is completely the intolerable, which is not acceptable at all. So we have to have a control. This control has to address all these hazards and has to prevent them or to control or to mitigate them before the product is being launched to the market. And the risk in the bar method, a broadly acceptable region, this will, uh, might not need any, any mitigation. However, it needs to be addressed by a, a mean. A lot this part that we will discuss here. What is a lot against Alara? A lot as low as reasonably practical approach. But the Alara, which is as low as reasonably achievable approach, the predictability might, for example, if I have two company, two companies, both of them producing syringe. So the first company, he, they said that, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, this risk, I have this risk inherently in my product. However, it is practically impossible to do it. This is completely unacceptable for the risk assessment. So they now are speaking about another terminology, which is LARA, which is as low as reasonably achievable. So the point here, it is not left to the company to decide the practicability of the control they are doing. It is about achievability. So is it achievable and reasonable to do this control or not? If it is achievable, the client has to do it. He is enforced to do this. But if it is practically, because the word practically contain uh, 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 two words, which is economic point and technical point, it can be practicable from the technical point of view, but it is not practicable from the technical point of view. So it leads to the client, if he is using the alert method, he will ignore the control because it's say, commercially not acceptable. But now, using the ELARA as though as reasonably achievable, it left to the, uh, uh, to the user to check is it in the in the in the market right now is there achievable it is is it achievable to prevent this risk from coming up or from hurting the user or not so now we can go back to the uh, the previous one we can call it bar and ilara and intolerable here Again, for the practicability consideration, it might be thought that any risk associated with a medical device would be acceptable if the patient prognosis were improved 
This cannot be used as a rationale for the acceptance of unnecessary risks. All risks should be reduced to the lowest level practically, bearing in mind the state of the art and the benefit of accepting the risk and the practicability of the further reduction. Practicability refer to the ability of the manufacturer to reduce the risk. Practicability has two components. One of them is technical practicability and another one is economic practicability as been anticipated in Annex D 8.4 for the 14.971. So from the last slide we now are using ELARA instead of ELOG. Now I need to discuss the uh, effective implementation of risk assessment. What point, what is the market, what is a player in the blade group? Uh, I'm sorry about this interruption. Uh, um, so now we are in the point of uh, how I make effective an implementation for the risk assessment. So if I put together those seven stuff at the front of me and digest them together all in one stomach, I think we will do an effective implementation for the risk assessment, which is the intended purpose, essential requirements, labeling, validations, compliance, biocompatibility, and the classification of the product. Those terms intrinsically and inherently contain a risk, need to be addressed in the risk assessment. For example, for the intended purpose. Intended purpose of the medical device is the main driver for the risk assessment management. For example, if you tell me that this product uh, intended to be used topically on the scan, I mean, so all my risk assessment has to be focused on the interaction between, of the, uh, between this product and the scan. For example, if the product needs to be uh, is intended to make uh, two function or three function, for example, the goose swap. Goose swap some, some of them have been used on the uh, a, a breach, st breach skin uh, and other one with breached totally breached surface. So if I, in my intended purpose of this type of, uh, uh, let's give another example which is a surgical, which is being clear, more clear, which is the surgical gloves and the, uh, and the examination gloves. If my intended purpose is my gloves to be used uh, or intended to be used examination, so my risk assessment will focus on the use of uh, in case of examination only. So I will not uh, go deeper about the uh, uh, microbiology of the uh, of the product. It will not not touch uh, the organs by by, by by using this latex. It will not be used in open operation in the uh, operation theater. So the risk will, for the surgical gloves will be more comprehensive or more touchy and, and uh, will address uh, too much matters rather than the examination gloves. So the intended purpose will have to be careful writing up the intended purpose and not addressing what we have intended in the intended purpose in the risk assessment. If we do this, this is a breach for, for use the use of 14971. The classification, as we have said, it's intrinsically or inherently designed to reflect the, the, the risk assessment approach. By the way, this approach is sim uh, the, for simplicity purpose only. Uh, this is not correct or accurate 100 percent. I've just uh, I, I do this just to make to to put the classification, to correlate the classification and the risk assessment. For example, if I have the severity of the device and the vulnerability of using the device is quite high, the, a bit severe, so we will be tilted to the 2A and 2B and 3. Considering that the invasiveness and the mode of contact, which is considered about the likelihood, it might be transient, short term, long term. So, if we can, say, we can say that the long-term implant device with the higher severity and vulnerability of the user will be classified as three. If the device is transient use and the severity is less, so it will be plus one steroid. 
again, this approach or this, it is just for the simplicity, it is not accurate to be used for classification of, about the product. Instead, if you need to make the classification, make use of the MedDev for the classification along with Annex 9 of the U9342 WC. Here, the, the essential requirements. If you go, if you if you have a look to the essential requirement, you will find the word risk is being uh, addressed in most of the of the essential requirements. For example, in one, if you can see, provided that the risk which might be associated with their intended use. So the risk and the intended use. So in this is in the essential requirements. In the first essential statement of the essential requirement, it needs you to make assessment, risk assessment for the intended use and to check the benefit and make risk benefit ratio for the device. Here in this part you can make use the 14971 uh, as uh, mitigation for this essential requirements. You can you can say that 14971 can be used to uh, as as one of the uh, asset or one of the main things to say that my product comply with the essential requirement. The question will be coming later, is the 14971 is quite enough to say for the essential requirement number one, I'm using, I'm using 14971 so I apply uh, correctly the essential requirement number one. The answer, we will see the answer later. Second part, eliminate or reduce risk again. In relation to risk that cannot be eliminated, inform the user about the residual risk. So part two or section two of the essential requirement is mainly correlating the risk, the risk control and the valuability of the uh, control of the risk assessment and how to make the uh, direction for use to inform the end user about the residual risk. If we go to essential requirement number six, we will uh, we will check we will see that any undesirable side effect must be must constitute an acceptable risk when weighed against the performance intended. So again, we need to make the risk assessment and to for compliance with essential requirement part six to make the risk analysis and to make the control or the mitigation and we make, you make uh, uh, weighing between both of them the risk and the control and the benefit of the device. In 7.2, again, to minimize, it, it requires you to make the design of the manufacturing and the backing process as way as to minimize the risk posed by contaminants. So here, again, it speaks about the risk, it requires risk assessment, but here for the, the process itself taking account the intended purpose here. So we now have enter its combination in 7.2. The regulator here need you to, to combine between the intended purpose, the essential requirements, the labeling, and uh, all together in order to, to, to make effective risk assessment. Here in 7.4, for various parts, in, uh, in addressing risk of incorporating medicinal substances. So if my product contain medicinal substance, so this need to be addressed in the risk assessment. In 7.5, it speak again in the, in the red part here, residual risk to uh, patient groups. Again, it speak about the, uh, uh, the device must be designed, manufactured in such a way as to reduce to minimum the risk posed by substance leaking from the device. So leaking stuff need to be addressed in the risk assessment. Again, if the intended use of such device include treatment of a children or pregnant or nursing woman, the manufacturer must provide a specific justification for the use of these substances, again, according to the risk assessment. 7.6, it spoke about the risk bows by the unintentional ingress of substance. So it requires you to check what's being ingressed, can be ingressed uh, in, into the device. 
So the previous one in 7.5, it's, it's speak about leaking from and now coming ingressed in in 7.6. .7. Again, in 8.1, as far to reduce as far as possible the risk of infection to the patient, user, and third party. In 8.6, it speaks about to minimize the risk of microbial contamination. Uh, uh, here, they are speaking about the nice trial package. In 9.2, the risk of injury. So, the device must be designed and manufactured in such a way as to remove, minimize as far as possible the risk of injury, the risk of connect, the risk connected with reason, um, reasonably foreseeable environmental condition, the risk of reciprocal in interference, the risk arising, uh, arising where maintenance or calibration are not possible. So, in 9.3, again, in the essential requirements, speak about risk posed by the, uninten the unintentional ingress uh, of substance into the device, taking into account the device and the nature of the environment. Again, minimize the risk of fire. Then, in, in part in 11.2.1, again, it's, speak, it's speaking about where the devices are designed to emit hazardous level of radiation. So, the risk of radiation. Here, in 11.4.1, it speaks about eliminating the risk inherent in installation of the, about the emitting radiation device. Various, in, in 12, various type of energy source risk. Number 13, method by which the user is informed about the rest, which is the labeling and the, uh, the labeling, which the word labeling contains the direction for use, the unit label, the carton label as well. So, from the previous one, what I need you to stress about this point that the essential requirement, which is the main part of the directive, the main requirements of the directive is totally or we can say that 70% of which is considering or concentrating about the risk assessment. So I can say having a correct risk assessment, uh, it will be uh, you will you can defend your essential requirement uh, 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 applicability or uh, the compliance with the essential requirement can be fulfilled 70% only by the risk assessment. If you come back to the effective for the effective implementation with rigor to the biocompatibility, 10993-1 is addressing the requirements for the biological evaluation of the medical device. So we will check each hazard about the contact and uh, about the contact between the patient and device using the matrix uh, detailed and anticipated in the biocompatibility standard which is as well the biocompatibility Bio biocompatibility is being addressed in the essential requirement checklist as well. If we come here to the labeling, complaint and the vigilance, those three parts are totally interlinked to the risk assessment. How here? If we look here, now we have correlated, we know that there is a correlation between the intended purpose and the essential requirement. So any reviewer of the technical file will check the risk assessment. He will have the risk assessment at his hand, at his hand, so he will consider the correlation between the essential requirement and the risk assessment. He will look for the intended purpose. He will check the intended purpose and correlate the requirements and or the, uh, the is statement by statement and the intended purpose. Is it being addressed or is it covered by the risk assessment or not? Again, essential requirement, as we said, is about 70% of the 70% the compliance of which is being mainly about the risk assessment. The labeling is mainly an output of the risk assessment. Simple on the label, address of the manufacturer, the uh, the sterilization type. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, some information about when not to use the device, the instruction for use, the caution, the precaution, the precaution of the device, the alerts, the, all of this information coming up in the uh, direction for use has to be interlinked with the risk assessment. Again, the biocompatibility, as we said, it contains, it mainly 
is mainly about risk assessment for the uh, risk assessment for the device for the compatibility with the living uh, with the people who will, be, who, who will be using this. So the risk assessment I need when I when I'm reviewing the risk assessment I have to go to the bike compatibility documentation and check is the risk assessment correlated to the bike compatibility or not. Is the bike compatibility considering the uh, temperature of the extraction and the extract used is considered to be co to be correlated with the risk assessment or not? Is the essential requirement addressed? All the requirement for the uh, essential requirement addressed or correlated with the risk assessment or not? And again, we said that the classification is inherently uh, a risk assessment for the class of the device. Now I will speak about the labeling and complaint and how it's being correlated. Label, as we say, this is one of the output about the residual risk that cannot be uh, totally uh, uh, mitigated during the risk assessment. So I have to, to inform the user which is using uh, the labeling. The complaint, as we said previously, the vigilance complaint, etc. This is one of the input to improve your risk assessment. Again, not only your complaint, not only your vigilance system, not only your recall, you will make use about the recalls coming up and the vigilance system anticipated in the uh, MHRA website and the one coming up in the FDA website. Now, what is the correlation between the risk assessment and validation? One, once you make the risk assessment, you will come to some part that the com your compensating provision or your control has to be done according to validation. So the risk assessment will require some control. Some of those control need to be validated. So the validation is interlinked or interconnected by the risk assessment. Now we have addressed the main seven part, main seven interlinking stuff and the risk assessment. Again, if uh, I, I will consider that if I have a group working and a leader in, the, in, the, in, my, in, in my documentation right now, I will say that the risk assessment is the leader and all of these part, seven parts is being leaded by the risk assessment. The question now, does ISO 14971 deem the sufficient as a standalone harmonized standard to presume compliance with medical device directive? The answer is no. However, some of you now will ask me, uh, Mahdi, but uh, the, this is the only harmonized standard speaking about the, the risk assessment. Yes, I agree with you about this. But the point is, we have to consider issue raised while harmonization. If you go to the uh, harmonization section, uh, which is, I, I, I think it's a Annex, uh, Annex Z uh, in the 14971. It addresses the requirement which uh, prevent the, uh, the uh, SEN or the uh, Committee Europea de to, to accept the 14971 as full harmonized standard. So they have raised the following issues. He's, they say that the essential requirement, number one, is not directly covered by ISO 14971. Saying the standard does not provide requirement on design and the manufacturing. However, the standard provides a tool to generate the information that is necessary as a preliminary step for the manufacturer to demonstrate that the device is in conformity with essential requirements. So I cannot say that. Uh, applying 14971 standard only is enough to say that I have done the requirements for uh, essential requirement number one. Uh, we, I will come in details after these two slides why they didn't consider as uh, uh, 14971 will not be considered as a standalone for the risk assessment. The second part here the second sentence of the essential requirement is partly covered by 6.2 of the 14971. However, we will check together point number one, three, four, six below. 
essential. So we have now, we can conclude that we have essential requirement number one, two, four, five, six, seven point one. They have some concern with the 14971. Let us see what are those concerns. The following aspects have been identified where the standard deviates or might be understood as deviating from the essential requirements. Let's, let's take them one by one. The first one, why the 14971 is not considered as a standalone standard for the risk assessment, according to the standard 14971, the manufacturer may discard negligible risk. However, Section 1 and 2 of Annex 1 of the Medical Device Directive 9342 EC, as amended by 2747 EC, require that all risk without negligible, so I cannot neglect one of the risks coming up in the risk assessment for medical device. However, I have to control and make the uh, check what is the risk benefit ratio of this risk, even, even if it is a negligible risk. So, yes, so how all risk, regardless of their dimension, which means even the negligible risk has to be addressed in the risk, new risk assessment, need to be reduced as much as possible and need to be balanced together with all other risks against the benefit of the device. Accordingly, the manufacturer must take all risks into account when assessing Section 1 and 2 of Annex 1 of the Medical Device Directive. So first point now for the inharmonization or non-adherence of 14.971, that 14.971 allow the, uh, the user of this standard to discard negligible risk. However, in our case in 1 and 2 of Annex 1, we are not allowed to do so. In discretionary power of the manufacturer, so the, the manufacturer considered or has the power, according to 14971, have the freedom to decide upon the threshold of the risk acceptability. So the manufacturer will decide when he will consider this as risk. Uh, 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 this is a threshold of the risk. So below which, under this point, or under this severity and the likelihood, I, might be, I have the freedom, of, according to 14971, to consider this an negligible or I will not take any action for the compliance. However, Section 1 and 2 of Annex 1 of the Directive require that all risk, all risk have to be reduced as far as possible and that risk combined together with all other risk against the benefit of the device. Accordingly, the manufacturer may not apply any criteria of risk acceptability before applying Section 1 and 2. The third point for non-adherence of 14971 is the risk reduction for as far as possible versus as low as reasonably practicable. This is as we have discussed in, uh, in the difference between ALARA and ELARB. So the medical device directive, the directive requires you to use ELARA and not to use ELARB. So we will take out any economical consideration uh, or any element of economic consideration uh, from the risk assessment that we are using. However, we only will speak about the uh, ELARA, which is achievability rather than practicability or economic practicability. So we can speak about technical consideration, not economical consideration. However, the first indent of Section 2 of Annex 1 to Directive 9340WC and the various particular essential requirements require risk to be reduced as far as possible without there being room for economic consideration. Accordingly, manufacturer notified body may not apply the ELARB concept with rigor to economic consideration. So what I can, I may use the ELARB, but if I have to define the word practicable uh, to be technical practicability, not economic practicability. 
here the fourth the fourth non adherence with with medical device directive in 6.5 6 for 14.7.1, it requires you, it doesn't need to take place uh, uh, the control. You need to make, you can, uh, you, you are not required to make risk benefit. You are not required uh, to take place if the overall residual risk is judged acceptable. Again, so in 6.5 and uh, in, in close 7 of ISO 14.971, those statement which is highlighted in green here is not acceptable from the from the competent authority or from the uh, the, the direction of the uh, medical device directive. Accordingly, to section one of annex uh, annex one of uh, directive number three forty two WC, an overall risk benefit analysis must take place if in any case, regardless of application of criteria established in the management plan of the manufacturer. Furthermore, section 6 of Annex 1 to the Directive 9342WC uh, require undesirable side effect to constitute an, accept, an acceptable risk when weighed against the performance intended. Accordingly, the manufacturer must undertake risk benefit analysis for the individual risk and the overall risk analysis weighing all risks combined against the benefit in all cases without any exception. The fifth Anan adheres as um, if we go through 6.2 uh, 14971 it requires you to use either for your control uh, inherent safety by design protective measure or to send the information uh, uh, to the user using the direction for use or the label, etc. However, here indicate that further risk control measure do not need to be taken if after applying one of the control option, the risk is judged acceptable. So, for 14.971, if you apply one of those techniques and you consider the risk is acceptable, this is it. You don't need, according to the requirement for 14971, to go further to take out or to eliminate the risk. However, the second sentence, sentence of Section 2 of Annex 1 of Directive 9342WC requests to conform to safety principle, taking account of the generally acknowledgeable, acknowledged state of the art and to select the most appropriate solution by applying cumulatively what has been called the control option or control mechanism in the standard. So, the manufacturer must apply all control option and they may not stop his endeavor if the first or the second control option has reduced the risk to an acceptable level. Let me, let me clarify this point a bit. So, if I have a risk of uh, uh, severity 3 and multiplied by repeatability 3. So the, my risk will be 9. If I apply control to increase the, the likelihood to be 2, so it will be 3 by 2 which is equal 6. According to this standard, you have the option to stop the risk assessment and now to consider that this risk is acceptable. But for the medical device directive, it needs you to take the 6 value to apply another control to make it 2.2 to be 4, for example. And then to, you might apply another control to control it, to put it to the very minimum risk to the, uh, to the end user. Sixth deviation in 6.2 of ISO 14971 applies the manufacturer to use one or more of the following risk, risk option that we have highlighted in the last, uh, last uh, slide. However, the first intent, intent of the second sentence of Section 2 of Annex 1 to Medical Device Directive requires to eliminate or reduce risk as far as possible, inherently safe design and the construction. According, accordingly, as the directive is more precise than the standard, the manufacturer must apply the former and cannot 
rely purely on the application of the standard. So the conclusion here is we have to make, we can make use of 14.971 but we have to apply another star, another option in order to comply with the medical device directive because of those non-adherence those non-adherence the last uh, non-adherence here uh, information of uh, information of the users influencing the residual risk the residual risk in 2.15 and the 6.4 of 14971 define risk remaining information for safety to be control one of the control options. However, the last indent of the of section two of Annex One says that Annex One uh, says that user shall be informed about the residual risk. This indicates that according to Annex One and the contrary to the concept of the standard, the information given to the user does not reduce the residual risk, the risk any further. So accordingly, manufacturer shall not attribute any additional risk reduction to the information given to the user. Here, conclusively, you cannot, for example, put to the, uh, uh, if you are producing orthopedic and you send the product to be sterilized by the, by the end user, by the doctor, and before applying this, before implanting this to the user, so you can you cannot make further to make your risk assessment uh, until this point. Until I have I have given the information to the user, and it is their responsibility to apply the uh, sterilization uh, according to their needs. It cannot stop that way. I can I have to give them clear instruction how they handle the device. And in my risk assessment, not only relying on the, I, I have put this in the, in the direction for you, so I, do, I don't need to make any mitigation. This is the part. So uh, not only uh, if, I, if I have a uh, information supplied to the uh, user, I have to uh, validate that the information supplied to the user is, will guarantee the safety of the user eventually. Last but not least, what about risk assessment and the new version of the standard? This is my last, uh, this is just a note I need to, uh, to give it to everybody, which is what's new in 13, and 13485. 13485 uh, is now, is about to be changed based on the change uh, for the high level structure uh, coming up with uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago for the 9001-2015. However, uh, they still uh, addressing some part related to the harmonization for 13.45. So from my point of view, I, I expect the new version of 13.45 to be 2016 and it will appear, it will be available, the, 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 um, uh, will be available to the market but in the first quarter or second quarter of the next year. By the way, the publication of the next version of 13.45 is postponed 2016. Uh, during the last meeting of the technical committee working group held in July, last July, they published the draft version of 1345 was submitted to, to be uh, for the vote, voting system of the working group member. The draft was not approved yet. So ISO technical committee 210 is the technical committee of the ISO organization. They have now uh, produced a high level structure so I expect the new standard for 13.45 to come up with in section 6 mimicry. Uh, likewise, what happened in 9001-2015, it will address the requirement for risk assessment. And from my, uh, from my information from the uh, reviewer there, they will uh, integrate some requirement from 14.971 into 13.485. Uh, here, this is uh, you. You can find this in BSI uh, Group website. It gives you the uh, history and the potential timeline of uh, 2000 and, uh, 2016 version of 13485. Finally, I would like to thank you uh, for being patient. I'm sorry again for the interruption coming up for the uh, 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 during the training, and uh, I thank you. I will be ready for question if we have time to that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mohammed. Again, I want to apologize for the technical issues during the presentation and for any inconveniences. Unfortunately, because of the time limited, we will have to conclude this presentation. You can send your questions through email and we will answer to them individually. Thank you again, Mohammed, for this informative and useful presentation. I want to thank all the attendees as well for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us. We hope you enjoyed this webinar. Please check PECB's webinar schedule in our website www.pecb.com or our official social media network since next week we are organizing webinars on interesting topics. Next Monday we are hosting a webinar on the topic process-based auditing. Thank you everyone. Thank you.